church and guests who are with us today. We're so glad that you've come to uh, begin this week by worshiping the risen Christ who died, was buried, and risen. We've got some great, uh, great report for you. You see here our uh, evangelism report. And if you're visiting with us today, you may say, why in the world do they have balls in a vase? Uh, the reason why is, is because we want to keep accountable, every one of us keep accountable and how much we really do believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to tell a lost and dying world. And so these orange balls here, they represent that members of our church reported that 30 times they shared the gospel, that people are sinners, that Christ in His love and God's love died, was buried and raised for their sins, and called them to repent and believe. So 30 times the gospel went out from you this week. One of those times, because every time you share the gospel doesn't mean somebody gets saved, but you'll never see someone share the gospel if you don't ever, if you, or you never see somebody accept the gospel if you don't ever share it. One of those 30 accepted Christ this week, and so we give praise and glory to God for that. And then a few weeks ago, we sent, as a church, we sent a team to Madagascar to go share the gospel. And there was a pastor's conference, and they brought on some other people there. And a member of our church shared the gospel, and a man got saved, okay? So that was a green ball. We've already celebrated. Yep. But he got baptized this, uh, this past week, and so we praise God for that. And not only that, he said, come and tell my family his wife got saved, and they had purchased a bunch of witchcraft from the, the, the witch doctor, and they sent our team and our pastors pictures of burning all of it up so that they could share Jesus. Now, you may say witchcraft. We don't do that here in America. But you know what? You've got, all of us have got a lot of idols. Uh, we, we've sophisticated them <laughs> that we need to burn. That is the power of the gospel. And if you're here today and you don't know the freedom that Jesus Christ can give you, you're going to hear about it today. And we hope that today you'll respond. Now, let me read our text together. And if you would, please stand with us as we honor God's re uh, the reading of God's word. And if you want to join me, you can. And here we have it here on the text. And so join me if you want to. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Does anybody believe they can trust in the Lord today? Yeah. Amen. We can. And so let's go to the Lord in whom we can trust. Father God, we come before you and we realize, Lord, we rejoice over witchcraft items being uh, destroyed. But Lord, if we were to not look so sophisticated in our lives and in our homes, at the stuff that we have, Lord, there's probably some stuff that we need to burn. This week, Lord... We've not trusted in you as our refuge and our strength, as the God in whom we can trust. We have said things we shouldn't say. We have thought things we shouldn't think. We have done things we shouldn't do. And God, before we come to worship you and celebrate, God, we lament for our sins. Even those of us that are saved, Lord, we're, we've let the flesh get a hold of us in some way. And so, Lord, right now we corporately lament over our sin. Dear God, please forgive us. But Father God, because of the gospel, those of us that have been freed, we know that if the Son sets us free, we are free indeed. And so, Lord, we, write, we commit right now, Lord, the things that we've done in the past, that, Lord, we acknowledge them, we confess them, we ask for your forgiveness, and, Lord, we want to repent, which means we want to put them away right now in the name of Jesus. And so, Lord, in our minds, as we sing, as we hear the word, as we respond to the altar, we commit this service to you. For it's in Jesus' name we humbly pray. And if you agree with that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. amen.
have a copy of scripture this morning, I'd ask you to join me uh, in Psalm 91 this morning. Psalm 91 as we begin our time together and as we uh, prepare to look at this psalm, um, I've heard this before. I don't know that I've ever experienced it, but I hear that there are things in life that people are afraid of. I, I don't know that for myself personally. Uh, but I hear there are things people are afraid of in life. Does anybody have any fears? Don't worry, we're not going to use it against you. You do? You do? All right, what is it? Talking in front of crowds? Yeah. <laughs> you can, yeah, you're shy. Yeah. But we, we have fears, right? We, how many of you would say, hey, I have a fear? All right. I, I, I know in my household there are some fears. Um, I just got a look from my wife, and she said, the eyes said, you better not. Uh, uh, I know in my house, bugs, frogs. Uh, I know one morning I, I was woken up very early in the morning, uh, and I was uh, locked and loaded because of what I heard, like somebody's coming in the house, something's happening, and there was. There was a toad that had hopped in the front door, and... Uh, but, you know, we have fears, and some of them are rational fears. We have fears when we hear the word cancer and when we hear about death, and sometimes they're irrational. In fact, one time several years ago, I was preaching 
uh, talking about fear, and I said, you know, sometimes it's rational, sometimes it's irrational, and I said, uh, and I knew there was somebody sitting in the crowd that had this particular fear, and I said, you know what, some of us are scared to death of clowns. In fact, look at the screen, and uh, this person came up to me after the service and said, you almost had to call the ambulance because I had a heart attack. Uh, I thought there was going to be a picture of a clown that came up on the screen, but you know, we, we deal with fears, and, and, and some of it's rational because we've seen people that have suffered under sickness and cancer and pain, and we've lost loved ones and, and those things. I, I remember a number of years ago, um, Jacob was just getting to the point where he was big enough to ride real roller coasters. He, was, he had graduated from the mini mine train at Six Flags, and uh, we were at Six Flags with a little buddy, a family friend of ours, and uh, who's going to ride the one with the loops. What is it? What's it called? Shockwave, there you go, y'all know it, all right? And so as we're going, and so him and his little buddy, who was actually about a year or two years younger, who had already written it, was like, oh, you can do it, you can do it. And so they're up there, me and this other dad are walking back, and they're walking towards it, and Jacob's like, I'm gonna ride it, I'm not afraid of that. And so as we got closer to it, he started slowing down his walk. And then all of a sudden, he was no longer standing with his buddy, he was standing, clinging to my side. He's like, I was going to ride with Landon, but I decided, Dad, that I I, I decided I'm going to ride this one with you this time so you don't have to ride with Matt. Y'all are too grown up. You know, he started rationalizing. I said, hey, that's fine. That's cool. Um, And so uh, we went. And and so um, in Psalm 91, what we see see is this is a psalm of trust. It It is about overcoming fear. It is about the fact that when we reside in the presence of God, that we don't have to fear what's out there. It puts fear in its proper place, rightly fearing God instead of situations and circumstances, amen? Which is kind of the sermon up front, but I want us to look at the text because this is what it says. And so I I want us to see Psalm 91. This is a psalm of trust. And so I want us to look, and we're just gonna take it apart and take a couple takeaways at the end from it this morning, but I want us to see right as we get into very first verse one, which verse one really see, serves as kind of the theme of it, but it's the truth. And so I, I've called this, this verse one is the truth. Look at what it says. It says, he who dwells in the shelter of the most high will abide in the shadow of the almighty. And when you read that, it almost sounds a little redundant, doesn't it? He who dwells in the shelter of the most high will abide in the shadow. It's like, He who lives in the house will be out of the sun. You say, well, that makes sense. But this is just showing that uh, within the presence of God, when we choose to dwell and we choose to draw close to God and we come close to him, there is shelter, there is protection. That word there is translated many different ways, depending on what translation you have. Protection, some of them say. In the shelter of the most high. That person will abide in the shadow, and it's the picture of being removed from the scorching heat of the day, which we can identify identify with right now, amen? Amen. Will dwell, will abide in the shadow. And so this is the truth, and it's just this statement of fact, but what's interesting in verse two, and and, in the way this psalm is written, so many, especially coming into book four, which uh, book four, if you look back in Psalm 90, starts book four of the Psalms. Uh, some of your uh, Bibles might say book four, and it kind of starts in those. So many of these deal in a corporate, but this is a very individualistic Psalm. It's different than the others that surround it. Because what happens in verse two is the psalmist writes this. He not only says, here's the truth, here's the theme of what I'm talking about. He says, this is the truth that I know by experience. So verse two is the truth known by experience. Look at what he says. He says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And so as the psalmist writes this, he would say, there's this broad truth that those who reside and dwell in the presence of God get the, the, the benefit of, of his protection and his watch care over them. But the psalmist says, that's a great truth that is out there, but this is the truth that I know by the experience of my life. This is, we, we just sang a few moments ago, we sang the song, this is 
my story. This is my, we're able to sing that song about Jesus and what he's done for us because this is the testimony of our lives. I've experienced the forgiveness of God. And so that's my story. That's my song of how God's worked in my life and is working through my life. And so as the psalmist writes this, he says, this is the truth known by experience. I will say, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And so this truth, those who put their trust in God will have the benefit of his security, of his safety, of his protection, of his presence. And the psalmist says, this is the reality that I've experienced. I know it's been said out there. I know it's in God's word that this is who he is, but this is what I have experienced. And you and I, we have that testimony. There are those that are sitting in this midst that say, hey, I face down fear and situations in my life, but I'm able to say that this truth is true because I've experienced it. That when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that I didn't do it alone. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's experience. And so we see the truth. Those who put their trust in God will have the benefit, have the privilege of his security, his safety, his presence, his protection. And then verse 2, we see the truth known by experience. But then what happens in verses 3 through 13 is we go and we have this truth pictured. And what he does in a few ways is what he does in verse 3 through 8, which we'll walk through it. He, he goes and talks about the things that are there in life that people fear. And then he gives two metaphors for God's protection. And in verse 9, he comes. And in this poetic structure that he uses here, he kind of works his way through something, goes back and works his way back through, through it. You don't care anything about that. It's called a chiastic structure. You won't remember any of that after I said it right now. Except that you, if you uh, seminary folks that are here, everybody else, you'll be like, okay, that's great. I don't remember that word. It's okay, you don't have to. But he reiterates these things in a poetic nature that takes us through the spot. And then he comes to verse 9, and he reiterates this truth that we saw, that it was declared at the beginning, this truth that was declared and this truth that was experienced. And then he moves back in verses 10 through 13, and he talks about, again, things to be feared, that people fear, but also comes back to God's protection. And so that's what happens. So we see this picture throughout these verses. And so I want us to look through this picture together. And it lays out several of the things in life. And, and really when you look at this um, and, and you lay it out and, and we see particular things in there and you say, well, well, that's not really, we, we don't really fear pestilence anymore. But in the context that this was written, this was a huge thing. This was, that would wipe out their food source. And, and so, but when we look at these things, we see so many broad things. But as we step back, what we do, I believe the psalmist is doing is painting this picture and says, no matter what comes your way, there are going to be things that come at you that are scary, but yet he turns right around and says, let's go back to the truth. God is my refuge, my fortress. So let's look at it together. It says, for it is he, this is verse 3, who delivers you, talking about God, from the snare of the trapper. And says, hey, there are people that are out to get you. There are those that are coming against you. And it says, it is God who delivers you from this thing. And so we fear people that are out for us. And it might be in your workspace, and you know that person that's trying to get ahead. And so you, they're going to make everybody look bad so they look better. And you say, hey, you know what? I'm the, I have fear because of this person that's out there. And it says, God is bigger than that person. He is greater, and he is the one who delivers. It goes on. And from deadly pestilence, that would come around, that would remove the way for you to physically sustain life, your food, your water. It says God. He delivers from those things. In verse 4, it moves on, and it moves into one of those metaphors. It says, he will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek the refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. We see these two metaphors. It is that of a, a bird. A one, have you ever seen a bird that has little chicks before? Anybody? 
when they're out running around on the ground and, and you happen upon them, what happens? Do those chicks come running at you because they're big and brave? No, they turn around and they run to mama, and what does she do? She gets as big as she can, she puts those wings out, and on the bird, those pinion feathers or those wing feathers are there, and they look as big and as bad as they can to provide a place of protection, a place of covering for those who says, God is like that that he stands in between those that would come to snare and trap you. He stands in between you and the pestilence. He stands there as a protection. He goes on and says, under those who under his wings, but here's the unique thing, remember this. Every time that I've seen that before, where I've seen a bird that has had the young ones, you know, at our neighborhood we have a lake and there'll be uh, some geese and some ducks that have them and they'll run around. But you know, those who get to enjoy that protection are the ones who run to the protection. And so for you and I, we have to remember, like we choose to come to God. We choose to enter the fortress. We choose to come to that place and say, you know what, I'm gonna take this on on my own or I'm just gonna run to God because I know he can handle it. It says, under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is like a shield or a bulwark. And some of your translations there in the last part might say buckler. And it's dealing with a military metaphor here of a shield. And a shield would have been a big shield that a two or three soldiers would have been able to hide behind. It would have been placed on the ground and they would gather behind it. But the buckler, that, that small one that's there is one that was strapped to the arm. And then here it was is whether we were in defense and whether we were in that place or even as we go throughout life as the soldiers that's on the battlefield moving, he still has protection with him. And as we go through life, we know that we do not go alone, that God is there with us. He goes on in verse five, he says, you will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by the day and the pestilence that stalks in darkness and the destruction that lays waste at noon. And I don't know about you, but if you just read that in and of itself, it sounds like the beginning of a horror story. It's like, I don't want any part of any of those things that are listed there. And there's some debate about whether this is moving towards demonic things. I think there is an element of that because we have a God. We realize in the reality of Scripture that we aren't necessarily in a battle with flesh and blood and weapons that are formed by hands. We understand that there's powers and principalities at work. I mean, uh, we got the pictures of a, a, a now brother in Christ in Madagascar who was trusting in things. Spiritual warfare is a real thing, people. Who he had at a point in his life said, my protection only comes through what the witch doctor has to offer. But now, I mean, I've got video of a fire roaring of the things that he said, this is my protection. And he says it is of no value compared to God. He says, you will not be afraid of the terror by night. Right? We, we, we get afraid, right? How many of you hear a sound in the night and you're excited to go check out what it is? Anybody? Just one. Two. All right. Well, there's your two guys. If you hear something in the night, just give them a call. They'll be right over. But man, the arrow that flies by day and the pestilence that stalks in the dark, the destruction that lays waste at noon. And he moves on and into a, a military sense in, in verse 7. And look at what he says. He says, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. Do you see the confidence? Remember, the psalmist is writing and he's encouraging those that read this. He says, I've had the experience of God's protection and safety in my life. And so I'm telling you, this is the truth that I've experienced it. This is the truth that the word of God declares, and this is the truth that I've experienced in my life. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. You will see God work on behalf of his people. As we look through this, and, and there's some debate. We don't know exactly who the author is. There's some that, uh, that have debate over this. If 
Uh, you look into certain things, some uh, ascribe it to David, but in, in, in the general writing of it, there's ascribed to nothing. You go back to Psalm 90, it's ascribed as a psalm of Moses. And so um, some people say, well, this is probably a later date, and so this is written as, as those that were dealing under uh, Babylon, Babylonian captivity and, and battles. And so we see the protection of God, and they're encouraged by that. And there are those that go, well, it was probably written early, and so we see so much. And there's a lot that you see in here that uh, goes along with Moses and his account. Uh, but here's the great thing, uh, and here's the truth. We don't know which it is, but here's the great thing. God is still the same in either situation. So the God who provided t- protection uh, in the time for his people, in the time of uh, the Babylonian captivity and all of that, is the same God that was there with Moses and the people of Israel as they wandered uh, through the desert. Amen? Amen. And so it, it, it works both ways. So yes, we, we can look and we see. And, so, and then in verse 9, he comes to this point, he reiterates this truth. He says, for you have made the Lord my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. He comes back to that dwelling place and that refuge. He says, this, this is what you've got to do. This is the place where you've got to get to. And he goes on in verse 10 and he talks about some more things. He says, no evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. And I, I, I want to make sure we understand clearly right here what's being said and what's not being said. Uh, there are those of the prosperity gospel that want to take this and say, God wants no sickness and no uh, heartache and no pain to ever. You should never experience those things. If you've been alive for longer than five minutes, you know that you're going to experience those things. It says here, it, it, it's the sense in which this is written. No, it says, it, it's, it's saying ultimately it will not overcome you. And I think it looks beyond this life to eternity. It says no matter what comes our way, because he, he's not diminishing these things. He's not saying that there aren't going to be people that try and snare you and trap you. There are, isn't going to be pestilence. He's not saying that there won't be terrors by night and there won't be arrows that fly by day and there won't be pestilence that stalks in the darkness and there won't be destruction that lays waste at noon. He never says those things won't happen. But yet he's saying, I can live in confidence because I know the God that I serve even in the midst of those things. He says, those things will not ultimately triumph over me. And I think it it, it looks to the fact that, that you and I need to live now with that confidence, but looking forward. We say, you know what? God will deliver. He goes on, look at it, it says, No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near you, for he will give his angels charge concerning you. So this is God who is our shield, our bulwark. He is uh, the Almighty. He is the Most High. But he says not only is God at work, but those, his angels, his created beings, have been given charge over us. God has given his angels charge concerning us to guard you in all your ways, that they will bear you up in their hands, that you do not strike your foot against a stone. And so this, I think, reiterates the truth, going back to some of those previous verses, that there is, in a sense, the the physical reality, but the spiritual reality that's at work here within this text, that the psalmist is looking at these physical things that we're afraid of, but we realize that there's a spiritual battle going on, and it's real. And this is a verse, you know, in Jesus' temptation that Satan used, and I'll say he used this out of context. You know, when we teach people here at Lane Prairie Baptist Church to study and teach the Word of God, we drill the very first thing that we drill into. We do this all the way down to our students, our students here. What is the very first thing that you're taught when you come to a passage of Scripture that you need to understand is the what? Context. (laughs) Context matters. And if you notice, if you go back and you look, the very last phrase of part of this is left off by Satan as he, he says it's the Jesus. Remember, he took him up and says, here you go. Remember, throw yourself off. Remember what God said? He says, hey, look, he's given his angels charge over you to guard you. And he left off the phrase, in all your ways. 
And so in the sense here is, is Jesus realized, hey, my job's not to put God to the test. My job's to be obedient to God and trust in his protection as I walk in obedience to him, as I reside in his presence, as I remain there. And so for you and I, we understand that God is for us, that God is our shield and our bulwark. He is the place for us for safety and shelter. But yet he's also given his angels charge over us. You say, how exactly does that play out? And I would say, I don't know. <laughs> but I know what the word of God says. He says that his angels are at work on my behalf in a realm that I can't see right now. But I know it's there because he says it is. He watches, he protects. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. No, notice again, prosperity gospel wants to go and say none of these things, right? He didn't say, hey, guess what? The rabbit and, you know, the worm. You know, he didn't go to these things and diminish them because the lion and the cobra are big, scary things, all right? I've been to the Fort Worth Zoo. Um, has anybody been to the Fort Worth Zoo? Has anybody seen the King Cobra there at the Fort Worth Zoo? It is behind a whole lot of glass, but I am terrified. And I'm, when I go, like, I'll stand back. Like, like I can tell you, I, like, I know where it's at when I go in the reptile house. I know when I come in and I make that corner right there on that lone wall right there on the left. You know what I'm talking about. It's there on the left. It's got a big, tall case that goes all the way to the ceiling. I will step back and I'll say, you know, I'm going to move these in there before I go up there. I'm going to make sure there's no holes in the glass. There's no door open in the back. He doesn't take these little things and say, hey, they're not these big, scary things because they are. But God is bigger. Remind what he says. He says, hey, you will tread upon the lion and the crow, the young lion and the serpent, and will trample them. He, he, he reiterates, he, he goes back, and he says the same thing again. He says, look, here it is. It's big, it's scary, but God's protection. He's at work. He's a place of safety. He's a place of shelter. He's given his angels charge over you. And so we, we look at this passage, and this is the confidence in which we must live this life. But we, we, there's a tension here of how do we reconcile and how do we live in such a way in which we know that we experience pain and suffering and heartache and we know that there are hurt and we know that we're attacked and hurt at times. So how do we reconcile that? And I think as the psalmist writes this, he's writing it to say, this is how we need to live in this life. And it's not to say that you'll never experience it and that you'll never get hurt. But he says it's the right focus. And I think one of the greatest quotes I've ever read concerning this passage is written by Charles Spurgeon as he deals with this. And I want to read it to you is what he says in concerns to this. And it helps to shift us as we go through and we look at the pain and the heartache that we know, it casts it in a completely different light that we don't even see it as the same thing because we rightly see who God is. Listen to what he says. He says, it is impossible that any ill should happen to the man who is beloved of the Lord. You say, well, that, I, I've experienced that. That doesn't make sense. Let's listen to the rest. He says, the most crushing calamities can only shorten his journey and hasten him to his reward. Ill to him is not ill, but only good in a mysterious form. Losses enrich him. Sickness is his medicine. Reproach is his honor. Death is his gain. No evil in the strict sense of the word can happen to him, for everything is overruled for good. Happy is he who is in such a case. He is secure where others are in peril. He lives where others die. What a very different way to look at what we experience in our life, in the pain, in the heartache, in the persecution, in the terrors that come, and, and the snares that are set for us. And we look at it and say, you know what? All this does is hastens me towards my reward. I might fall in battle, but you know what? Because I know who God is. It's only gain to me. That's why the Apostle Paul was able to say, to live is Christ and to die is 
gain. And so that's why within this psalm, I I think there's a balance here that we have to hold this tension that we need to live with this confidence right now. And it's not a foolish confidence to say, you know what, no evil shall befall me. We can say that, we can claim that because we realize no matter what comes out our way, God ultimately has us in eternity. And so if my time comes to an end here on earth, is that a bad thing for me? (laughs) No, I'm going to be far better off than I ever was on my very best day here. And so I think that's how we begin to reconcile this psalm. We, we live with this confidence because we know who God is. We know because his word says it, but we know because we've experienced his goodness and his protection. And then in the last part, real quickly, as we wrap up in verses 14 through 16, is... is it shifts from the psalmist speaking to these people and trying to encourage the reader here to God speaking. And it drives home this truth. The truth of God's protection is for those who know and trust God. Look at what it says. It says, because he has loved me. Again, this is like as if God, this oracle is as God was speaking because he, because a person has loved me and the way that is constructed, the way that is written, loved me. It says, they have made the choice to love me. This is a picture of covenant relationship between God and man in which we enter into this relationship with him because he has loved me, because he has made the choice to come into my refuge in my presence Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. This is a picture of a relationship. And so these promises are to be claimed by the believer. For the one who does not know the Lord, they cannot claim these promises. God is saying here to us, said, if you want to claim these promises, my protection and my safety and the fortress and, and reside in my shadow, he says, you have to know me. He makes these promises. When we do that, he will deliver us. He will set us securely on high. And he goes on in verse 15, says, even in the midst of these terrors and fears that we have, says, when we call on him, he says, I will answer him. We have a promise of answer prayer that he will hear us and answer us. And I will be with him, his presence, and I will rescue him and honor him with long life. And I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. And I believe that could be salvation here and now from that situation, but ultimately it's salvation in eternity because of that covenant relationship with God. And so quickly as we come away, what do we, what do we take away from this? What do we do with this? And I, I think this is a great psalm for us as we face fear that will help us to overcome fear. And there's a few things within this as far as application that I think we just we need to remember and we need to cling to is, is this. is If we're going to overcome fear, what we see in this text is that we have got to reside in the presence of God. It does no good to have a place of safety if we never run to it. June the 12th, I was in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I started getting text messages, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And then I get pictures of hail that's like the biggest hail I've ever seen in my life. I was talking to David this morning, and when, you know, they had one that fell and heard that, and that's weird, that. He's like, I'm going to go check out and see what that was. Maybe something's wrong with the horse. And then it came down. You know what David didn't do? He didn't run out from underneath his protection. He stayed in the protection of his home. We have to reside in the presence of God. You know this. We experience this in life. There's something about parental presence that alleviates fear whether it's Jacob walking up to the roller coaster with me and riding it with me, whether it's Cooper when I ride, he started to ride some bigger ones. And so when we get on there, you know, you've got your handles and all that. I'm not allowed, Candace isn't allowed to hang onto the handle. Our arm goes around Cooper and it draws him in close to us. He is under our wing. And so there is fear that is alleviated because there is safety in the presence of a father. And for you and I to experience and be able to face the things that we see in life, we have to reside in the presence of God. 
we have to dwell in the shelter of the Most High. We have to abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And then the final thing is this, is we simply need to remember who God is. Throughout this entire psalm, there are different names and titles that are used of God. There's not just one name. There are many names. And I think the psalmist does that to remind us about who God is because there is no one name or title that can give us a picture fully of who God is. We see he is the most high, and it's the word Elion, and it, it speaks of most high. It speaks and gives a sense of, of, of strength and sovereignty over a lot of things. And there's almighty, it's Shaddai, and it's this idea of power. It's, you see the word Lord, and in mine, it's in all capitals. That's the covenant name of God, and it reminds us that God is a God who makes promises and keeps promises. We see the word God, which is from uh, Elohim in there, and it's, it's th- this of a, a ruler or a judge that we see God who will judge judge rightly and will protect those that are his. And we see these things and we see the metaphors of of the bird and the shelter and all these different things. We need to remember who God is. And so when fears begin to get big in our lives, we need to go back and say, who is God? Well, 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 how do I know who God is? Well, there's only one way we know who God is. It's from his word. And I begin to read and I I begin to go and say, do I see a time in scripture where God acted on behalf of his people? And I say, yes, you do. You see it all the way from Genesis chapter three, all the way through Revelation. He acts on behalf of his people. There is Adam and Eve's sin that he created a way for them to be covered. Killed an animal, made skins to cover their nakedness. And you follow that thread all the way through to the cross of Calvary. In which God says, I've created a way for you to be good, to be made right with me. I remember who you are. You're a God who's faithful even when I'm unfaithful. Remember who he is, that he is a God who loves us, his children, those who love him and run to him and cling to him. So I don't know what it is that you're facing. There's, there's some of you that I know some of the stuff that you're facing. I want to remind you about the God that you serve. I want to remind you about who he is. I want to remind you that, hey, you're going to have pain and you're going to have suffering, but we run to God as our protection. And ultimately, no matter what befalls us in this life, none of it is bigger than God. He lists some big things here, but none of them are bigger than God. And then ultimately today, for the one here today who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, There is a fear that you should have when rightly seeing scripture. And it's the fear that this is that your sin has separated you from God. That you are dead spiritually and you are bound for eternal death, eternal separation from God. But praise be to God, there is a promise that is written. We see it in verse 16. He says here, he will honor us with long life and we will get to see a salvation. He writes this and he's dealing with these that that know him, but it's a promise, I think, that looks forward for us. It's fulfilled ultimately in Jesus Christ. If you've never come to the place in your life where you have placed your faith in Jesus, we're going to give you an opportunity in just a moment. Because the reality is, is that You have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that sin means for you death, physical death, spiritual death, eternal death, eternal separation from God. But God, in his love, sent Jesus, who came and lived the life that we could not live, perfect in obedience to God's commands. And then he went and died on the cross of Calvary bearing the wrath of God that's poured out against wickedness, removing the guilt of our sin. He was buried in the grave, and three days later, he was raised to life again. So that he would say, hey, you cannot just have long life here on this earth, 
by walking under my protection, but you can have eternal life through Jesus Christ. If we would repent, if we would turn away, if we would change our minds, we've thought one way about God, we've thought one way about our sin, we've thought one way about ourselves, and it was wrong. We thought we could deal with our sin ourselves, but yet we now see right and we think right that I can't deal with my sin. Only God can through Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to repent. I'm going to change my mind and I'm going to confess Jesus as Lord, as my only hope. He's going to be my shield. He's going to be my fortress. He's going to be my salvation. And so in this time of response that we have this morning, whatever the response is for you, maybe today you're dealing with something in your life that has just been heavy and you have let the fear of that become so big. I mean, I've dealt with people that never even leave their house because they're so afraid. We can give fear control. That doesn't honor God. When we live a life, we're going to say, you know what? No matter what comes my way, God's got it. And so I don't know what that fear is. It's the fear of living life alone. It's the fear of cancer. It's the fear of losing a loved one. It's the fear of those that have come against me, whatever it is. Maybe you need to be at this altar this morning and you need to say, God, I've, I've let that fear look a whole lot bigger than you actually are. Maybe you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus. We want to give you that opportunity. Maybe you say, hey, I've still got questions. That's great. We, we want to have a conversation with you about what it would mean for you to place your faith in Jesus Christ alone. Maybe you're here and you've been visiting and this is a place God has brought you and said, this is the place that I've brought you to be a part, a member of this church. And you'd say, hey, we want to join. Come tell one of us, hey, we, we want to join. We'll tell you how you can do that. And so this morning as Doughton and the others come, we're going to have some of our staff here this morning to receive you. And um, I'd ask, uh, Kristen, do you mind coming up this morning over here? May, maybe you're a lady and you're dealing with something and you say, hey, I need to talk to a lady. Kristen will be over here on uh, this side, um, maybe who you are. Uh, Ralph, Shirley, would y'all mind coming up over here? Maybe, maybe you're a married couple and you've got something going on. You say, hey, I just want to talk to somebody, somebody that would pray with me. But whatever it is, we pray that you would respond in obedience to God's word today. Father, today we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the truth that those who trust in you are safe and secure in you. And Father, we know we're gonna have pain and heartache in this life, but Father, as we've seen, we rightly see it in relation to you. Father, even though they might come against us and it might be physical and we might be hastened to the end of our life, but Father, we know that it just hastens us toward a greater good again in eternity with you as a believer. Father, today, for the believer here today that's let fear become so big that they cannot see you, Father, might they turn back to you. Might they turn to your word to be reminded of who you are. Might they run to you and reside in your presence through prayer, in your word, in worship. Father, for the one who does not know you, Father, might today be the day of their salvation. Might they experience your salvation that is available only through Jesus Christ. So, Father, move and work amongst us, and we pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.